Hello everyone, welcome back to Adventures Through the Mine. I am your host, as always, James W. Gesso. I'd like to start this episode with a big thank you to my patrons on Patreon, especially the people whose names are listed here on the screen on YouTube or in the description to this episode wherever you're wherever you're checking it out um, except for iTunes but for some reason I just don't have enough space I get just such a limited amount of word count to give a description for iTunes but regardless big thank you to them and to all of my patrons thank you so much for your ongoing generosity and support of the show it couldn't exist without you similarly big thanks to Alexandre who just sent me a really wonderfully substantial donation I really appreciate that um, and to everyone who's buying t-shirts and all the rest on the shop I really yeah I appreciate you uh, putting your money in and um, helping the show keep the lights on, as they say. Um, so yeah, huge thanks. If you're not yet a patron and you'd like to become one, please do. By heading to jameswjesser.com forward slash support, you'll find out information about it there, as well as other ways that you can support the show. So thanks for doing that. So today for the show, we have Stephen Jenkinson coming on for his second time on the podcast. The first time was uh, episode 59. It was called What Dying Means. And it was quite a poignant episode, as this one is too. Um, Stephen is a pretty deep man and uh, does not shy away from the hard to talk about um, topics. And uh, like the first one, which dealt very heavily around the topic of death and dying and what dying means and what it means to die well and how our current Western monoculture, uncultural um <laughs> thing that we got going on here, um, how its death phobia manifests in our dying, well, in our dying and how it sort of pushes us to not die well. Um, and this interview was originally going to be a, like a deeper dive into his book, Come of Age. Um, I'll hold a picture of it up for the people watching on YouTube here. Um, but I wanted to start with exploring some of, like follow up from things that were sort of left uh, left hanging in the first in the first interview, and uh, due to limited time, we only had an hour. That basically became the content of this interview. So it's kind of like a part two. Um, although you certainly don't have to have listened to the first part to uh, to hear this one and to get some value out of it. I was particularly interested in taking some of the concepts he initiated uh, in the first interview around dying well and dying, and then really expanding it and bringing it into a recognition of the global situation that we're in as we're facing the catastrophic consequences of our behavior over the last whatever 10,000 years or something uh, in the form of climate change and the risk of mass extinction um, but we we ease into that topic so no worries about jumping in right away but you know I haven't even read his bio some of you might not even have any idea who this who this gentleman is so let's let's get into that Stephen Jenkinson is an activist teacher author and farmer he has a master's degree in theology from Harvard University and a master's degree in social work from the University of Toronto. He is a former program director and medical school assistant professor. He is the subject of the National Film Board of Canada documentary film, Grief Walker. He teaches internationally. With Natalie Roy, Jenkinson founded the Orphan Wisdom School in 2010, which convenes in Tramore, Canada, and in various places in Northern Europe. He is the author of How It Could Be, now translated into four languages, Money and the Soul's Desires, Die Wise, A Manifesto for Sanity and Soul, and most recently, Come of Age, The Case of Elderhood in a Time of Trouble. With Gregory Hoskins and Ban, Stephen has offered Nights of Grief and Mystery to sold-out houses on three continents, most recently during the 26th day, excuse me, 26 City Nights of Grief and Mystery North American Tour, 2018. Um, so the two books of his that I've read, Come of Age and Die Wise, have been really powerful books in my life. And his performance with Gregory Hoskins' Nights of Grief and Mystery have has also been really 
beautiful and I've gone multiple times now trying to bring as many friends and family with me as possible because the impact of it um, into the quality of relating that can emerge um, between you and your loved ones I think is is or between me and my loved ones has been really powerful and really beautiful um, that said he's actually coming to a town uh, near me <laughs> he's coming to my city actually on a September 12th Yes, September 12th here in Kitchener, Ontario, as well as London, Ontario on September 28th. So I know there's a lot of international listeners and I, I don't, I'm not exactly sure how many people in the city I live tune into my podcast. Uh, but if you are in Kitchener or London and you want to go check it out, I will be at the Kitchener show. So come up and say hi. Links to getting tickets to that event will be in the show notes to this episode as well as basically all the other links that you would be expecting to be in the show. So uh, one final note before we move forward is like the first episode, episode 59, this one is audio only. So sorry to you YouTube watchers, but I do have some pictures of our likenesses up on the screen so you can gaze upon them as we speak if you uh, wish to do so. Um, I feel like it would get a little boring after a while, but hey, you know, that's, that's your prerogative, so do what you do. So that concludes this intro. Uh, please enjoy this second interview with Stephen Jenkinson here on Adventures Through the Mind. Okay, well, Stephen Jenkinson, welcome back to Adventures Through the Mind. Thank you. Uh, so as seems proper, my uh, preparation for this interview included uh, a number of things, but re-listening to the last interview we did um, from a couple years ago, I believe at this point, and uh, there's a few things that ended there that were interesting that I think are, are valuable to bring back in. Um, one of which was the acknowledgement of how there's no guarantees in the sense of who lives and who dies. Uh, and that it's, uh, you know, it wasn't, it wasn't written that this would ever happen again, that either of us or, um, or one of us would be alive to maintain the opportunity of a second interview so I right. want to take a little moment to celebrate that um, that having come into existence uh, you were also talking about writing come of age which has since now been written and I have read and very much appreciated it and this is the one that really struck me which was interesting you were talking about nights of grief and mystery and you said hey who knows I might even be coming to your town uh, which is funny because earlier this week you announced a uh, a concert you'll be doing in the city that I live in, in Kitchener, which is mm -hmm. funny timing. Yeah, yeah. All right, so the other things that I think are interesting to jump in on. Near the end, um, you spoke of dying, you referenced it um, as a god, and I've, I've mm -hmm. since heard you describe it otherwise as a deity. Um, and I'm wondering if you can start us off by unpacking what needs to be unpacked for under us to understand what you mean. What I mean when I say that death is a god, you mean? That's correct. Or what I mean by the the word god or deity, whichever or you think is going to help uh, <laughs> help us understand. I think possibly both. Okay, um, I, you know I'm not sure that understanding these things is a consequence of somebody explaining them. That's the first thing. Hmm. Um, even the person who said it. You know, the, the the place from whence it comes more often than not bears no resemblance to the place it ends up. So so the explanation is a, it's kind of over it's overplayed as a as a something that resolves uh, consternation or conflict or misapprehension or or any of that kind of thing. So with that in mind, uh, assuming that not, nothing I say will make it any better any easier, uh, nor should it be. Um, these things, I mean, the idea of a god, that could use a little work on the human side. I would assume that the gods have already labored quite considerably. The world might be a sign of that. Humans might be another sign. But humans could uh, imagine rather than being spoon-fed what constitutes something divine, they could actually, you know, labor on their end of things and uh, submit their beliefs and their certainties to some kind of scrutiny. Um, so, 
so that that's a big uh, preamble. Here's the amble part of things then. Yeah, it's to my mind, dying is much like uh, matrimony. And it's it's funny that that's those things have occurred to me so so uh, adamantly as being resembling each other, because I'm now I'm writing a book about matrimony as it happens. But um, by that I mean this: uh, matrimony is um, something you appear to enter, but just as much it enters you. That's one. Two, um, you might imagine that it's your matrimony, but you imagine that in vain. It's not your matrimony at all. Uh, three, uh, matrimony was around long before you were and all your ideas about it. Uh, four, uh, you didn't come up with matrimony. Uh, it may have come up with you, though. Uh, the chances are very good that someone's matrimony produced you. Uh, five, uh, the amazing thing about uh, matrimony is that it simply outlasts your take on it, you know, and and uh, the reasons that you enter into marriage are rarely, if ever, the reasons you you remain married. In other words, it's your take on things that is an early and fairly constant casualty of your enga- your living engagement with the things in question. And you know, I wish more North Americans, you know, took that to their breasts, so to speak, and and relinquished their death grip on their um, their own pers- personal beliefs and attitudes and opinions and things because it doesn't l- allow much room for the way things are and and the um the going concern which is in this case matrimony so you could say and i'm going to draw the parallel uh, out right now in a second you could say that matrimony's it's it's cardinal beauty is its unwillingness to align itself with what you think it should be. Uh, it's, simply, it's simply bigger than anything you can think of. And not only as a social institution, but as an existential encounter and as a, a perfect and proper way to extinguish hope and the allegation of future and potential and all those things. And I don't say that with any cynicism at all, because if those things aren't distinguished, You'll have hope instead of the person that you're sitting beside or lying beside. So the, what's the parallel then with dying? It's virtually identical. Uh, dying bears very r- little resemblance to what your belief system contends that it is. And be, given its, um, its primordial nature, dying, I think, is best approached, not understood, but approached as something that requires a total reassessment of what you think um, etiquette, you know, of the profound kind asks of you. I mean, you're alive. There's this thing called you're dying. It doesn't matter what you think about it. It's still there. It doesn't matter if you think about it. It's still there. Uh, it's, It's more there than you know how to be inside your own little life it's more faithful to you than anyone you know it doesn't mistake you for somebody else it doesn't follow someone else home late at night it's it's remarkably and and authentically faithful and we you know we could learn a few things from that and and then it's the magnitude of the thing simply beggars what you believe about it I wouldn't know what else to call something like that has that consequence and that that stature and that stamina, but divine or a god. So you could say that the gorgeous aspect about dying is that it eclipses your sense that it's, quote, your dying any more than there's such a thing as your god. After all, it appears to me at least that gods are consequences of and spirits of place first and foremost that's what they are they're place based identities and entities consequences and 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 claims and dying is remarkably located in place and time as well so um that begins to give you a sense of uh, 
after a long time wondering about these things, why it occurred to me that dying is properly uh, a deity properly asks of us something in the realm of real humility. And as long as you're willing to give it one seat at the table in the banquet hall of your days, it won't take over the place. And that's the great misapprehension. We think that these things are punitive in the, when they appear, but generally speaking, that aspect of them that seems punitive is a pure consequence of, of the, uh, the kind of beggaredness that we bring to it, the, the, the utter unwillingness to give it its due, uh, the kind of argumentative, uh, belligerent stance we take, uh, the belief that uh, our beliefs are somehow stronger or make a more enduring claim than the realities of life that are, that are there regardless of what we believe. And um, I, you know, deity is a strange word to choose in a time that's essentially post-God, if you will. Uh, I'm aware of that. And so this is me saying something in the order of, uh, hey, remember this? Remember the, the idea that something was bigger than you? It wasn't all bad. It didn't seduce you the way, you know, glaciers melting seduce you to a kind of just exotic misanthropy. That it's it's larger, and its its immensity doesn't leave you uh, diminished. It leaves you more informed than when you began the encounter. That's the kind of beginning. Hmm. Hmm. So I think it, I mean, maybe if I were hearing you speak for the first time, I might get the misunderstanding that when, or I, I might interpret what you're saying as though a suggestion that when death comes, you know, we let it in and we're okay with it. And I don't believe that's, that's what you're intending. So maybe you can give me a sense of that, like, what, does this look like me saying, oh, well, here it is. Okay, what have you got to teach me? Um, and I'm okay with you here. Welcome on in. And, you know, is is that... I, th I think you know the question that I'm asking here. Maybe. Um, you know, the first thing to say is it's a... <laughs> it's a catastrophically arrogant orientation to the presence of the divine in your life to imagine that, that you would somehow be calling the shots as to its presence or not and its consequence or not that kind of thing um that you're willing to learn and all of this kind of thing you know it's it's a sure sign that anybody who responds that way to the idea hasn't had the vaguest encounter with anything you could constitute as divine and how can you tell because the, of the unvanquished arrogance that leads with however it works, if it works out for me, then it's good. See, so the, the, the point of calling dying a god is to plead with people to recognize that it's not there to benefit you. It's there to see to it that you join the fray, you see that you enter into the time of your life when you're no longer a benefactor, excuse me, a, b a beneficiary. And perhaps you become something closer to a benefactor instead and stop being on the take and, you know, working out everything in terms of its benefit for you and beginning to recognize that, you know, as it certainly comes with age, the recognition that, that um, you, it's not a question of debt at least in my take on things, it's a question of the other half of the story. You know, we come as North Americans in particular, we're just, we're just ecstatic with the notion of the world being there more or less for my benefit, whether it's, you know, oil or whether it's ayahuasca, man, it's the same orientation, you know, mm -hmm. and whether in fact that we might be there in order to keep up our end of the deal which is to say that 
maybe the world could benefit from our presence just for a change instead of the other way around constantly. So the language of deity is an attempt to, to make a case for, for that kind of etiquette, really. And, you know, no doubt that me elaborating, you know, as I said at the beginning, me elaborating on what I mean by deity won't clarify anything for anyone who's not had the encounter with deity in their lives. <laughs> it won't help. <laughs> and uh, yeah, that doesn't trouble me. Um, uh, an encounter with, the, with the, I mean, the world's mystery religions across the board uh, re typically record encounters in which an engagement with something divine is so overwhelming, so overpowering, that there's very little of one's life that's left standing as a result of the nanoseconds of, uh, you know, kind of uh, bristling encounter with what you don't understand, have not readied yourself for, and haven't made room for. Well, I mean, we're having all manners of tastes of that now with, um, you know, with pieces of news about consequences that have been set into motion on our behalf uh, that we have no can exercise no dominion over. Um, that might be the beginning of a beginning of an understanding of what it means to have an engagement with the divine. An encounter with any death before your own is another such opportunity. Hmm. Something you said there um, pointed directly at something that's been happening as a pretty deep process in my life right now. Uh, which has to do with a colleague of mine who recently killed himself as a consequence of a psychosis he entered, which in, like there's a lot of things that were set in motion, but one of the big contributing factors was his excessive use of a, of a psychedelic drug called uh, 5-MeO-DMT, which users propose is basically like a straight one shot to God. Um, and it is an encounter with this mystery and he used it excessively, and in many ways he felt like he was in control, and he was channeling, and he was this and that. And I've been grappling with what all of that means and how I come to, you know, understand, well, how, how I come to place myself coherently in the reality of his suicide and everything that went around it. Um, and what you said there about, about, you know, you didn't say the term utterly undone, but I've heard you use the term elsewhere. Mm -hmm. around encounters with the divine really it, it's really helpful and um uh correlates well with with what i've come to how i've come to place myself in the in the context of his suicide no doubt uh, you know one of the most disarming prospects uh, of of listening to other people talking about things spiritual is the recurring theme that an encounter with something spiritual inherently is uplifting and deepening at the same time. It's enabling at the same time that it's, um, um, that it, it's measured, that it's good for you, that you'll know it's good for you, that it'll benefit you in every conceivable way and on and on and on and on. Uh, it, it's a staggering um, juvenile uh, understanding of the other than human aspects of this world, you know the the, the idea that if it's if you as long as you're open to it, it's okay. I mean, it's just unbelievable to me. Um, I, I had well, I was in Iceland. I just came back yesterday, and after one of the gigs, a number of people came up to me, thanked me for what I was doing, told me that I'd been influential in in their lives and in their capacity to help a, a friend recently die and so on. Although they said, yeah, it was a little difficult um, because he'd left it quite late. And anyway, we, we went to the psychedelic route and that really seemed to, to help. And I said, really, how? Well, we found that it really open, but you said that he died wired down and, and closed off and all of that. Well, he did, yes, we probably left it too late uh, to apply the psychedelics. And I said to them, do you think it might've had to do with the fact that you were counting on the psychedelics, quote unquote, opening him up? In other words, the drug would do all the work, just like this, you know, straight shot to God that you were talking about earlier. And so this is why I said 15 minutes or so ago, 
that the notion that dying is a deity is not an invitation to a leisurely traipse through the, you know, the ending of your days. This is an invitation to recognize the intense and considerable labor that is before you. And uh, I've never heard anybody seriously welcome that or understand it to be part of the God encounter. Uh, they're, they're just this kind of unvanquished understanding that like everything else, if you just come with the right attitude, it's there for you. I mean, I, I suppose people come to their romantic lives in, in a way that's drastically similar to that. That if you're just open to the possibility of a real encounter with a fellow human being, then the inevitable outcome will be a kind of delirious joy and a sense of being delivered from your personal sorrows, miseries, and, and isolation. And, and directly into the teeth of someone else's miseries and isolation, mm. at least as likely as anything else. So, so openness is a recipe for your brain falling out. It's not a recipe for things uh, inevitably, quote, unfolding as they should. So this this brings up a, a question that I was going to save till later, but I think uh, following what is now makes sense to ask, and it has to do with your thoughts on the on the movement around um, bringing psychedelics into palliative care. There's been some growing research over the last few years that working with psilocybin, which is the active agent in uh, in psilocybin mushrooms, for people who are terminally ill, uh, I believe often all the research has been done with cancer, um, in the in the mindset that it gives them an opportunity to um, really enter into a, an unresistant, unconstrained encounter with everything that they're feeling about all of this, and to trigger some sort of encounter with the spiritual world in the midst of this of of this uh, unconstrained feeling process, and that the like the clinical results, um, and this is you know clinical psychotherapy along with these psychedelics. This isn't just by any means giving people the psychedelics, hoping that opening them up is going to fix their dying problem or whatever. Um, that that the results are extremely positive for people um, being able to essentially go through the rest of their dying process with less antidepressants, less pain medication, not by any means none. Um, but it seems to have a positive impact as well as on how they show up to their dying time um, in, in a way that helps set the table um, at, to use, to, to, to paraphrase something that you've said in your movie Grief Walker, um, in, in, a, in a more, uh, for lack of better terms, positive way. And I'm curious, of course, doing what you do, you're going to come and encounter with droves of people asking you about psychedelics and dying. And, and given the research and, then, and given the, you know, say the, the underground interpretations of, of what psychedelics could do based on some, you know, menial reading of the research, where do you see that something like that could fit inside of the current death phobic culture and, um, palliative care institutions that we have in the modern world? Well, first of all, I, ha I haven't read the stuff. So um, there, was a, there was a part to your characterization. And, you know, obviously it's not your work. You're referring to things that you've read and so on. So I'm, I'm not holding you to account for it. Mm -hmm. But there's a piece missing at the end of your characterization. Uh, uh, it, something along the lines of, uh, so and if you take it and then it'll open you up to the da 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 so that what, though? No. That's the question. So that what happens? So that you have a deep, be, bigger, deeper. But these are all neutral descriptors. What, why is that a goal? Bigger, deeper, longer. Uh, you know, <laughs> I, I wonder what's the end game of this um, psilocybin enhanced encounter? I, what's it for? So that's the first thing. And I can't answer that, it, but I can, I can intuitively guess, you know, why there's so many takers for this kind of thing now. Mm. And it would be something along these lines. Just like euthanasia and half a dozen other things I, you know, I could think of off the top of my head. 
psychedelics are being embraced by a death phobic culture. That should tell you something. Just that piece of information. Psychedelics are being embraced by a death phobic culture when its citizens are approaching their deaths. Hmm. Does that mean that by virtue of the availability of psilocybin, that the death phobia of the culture is dissolved? Could it be at least not as likely that the advent of psilocybin is an attribute of the undissolved death phobia of the culture that, that is increasingly championing its availability? That would be my question. And it's a little more than a question. Obviously, it's a kind of shit disturbing detail right. <laughs> that I that I, you know, that I linger over because, uh, you know, let me tell you a little story. And then maybe me making that case becomes a little self-evident as to why I was in New York maybe two years ago or three. And and I was asked to present at a conference called The Art of Dying. Now, I'm quite sure that if they had to call the thing. Um, dragging your ass through the worry and the slurry of the ending of days, uh, they wouldn't have had a lot of people there. If they had a, had a, a, a phrase, a title, that in any way did justice to the ongoing realities of dying, they wouldn't have had many takers. And they knew that. So they called it the art of dying instead. And you know immediately if you call it that, you've turned it into something that is fundamentally decorative, life-enhancing, aesthetically compelling, just to choose three. So there I was, and I went second on the first morning. So the lady before me was obviously of the crowd-pleasing variety, and they chose well to begin with her instead of with me. And uh, I sat in the front row, and I waited my turn. And as she went along, she was digging for me a hole uh, as as people who come before you can do because they're establishing a certain, let's say vibe in the audience, a certain degree of expectation of what should be following them by virtue of this material they present and how they present it. And the kind of unspoken assumptions and, and uh, prejudices that are there. And, and she did so. And uh, one of the things that struck me is about uh, half of the way through, she was making the case that her, alternative universe, um, parallel reality, a self-appointed death care working brigade, credential free brigade. I could go on, but you get the idea. Uh, and these people have, have all arisen out of the ether in the last 10 or 15 years as fundamentally self-appointed uh, experts to eclipse the old expertise. She was describing uh, on, on behalf of these people, many of whom were in the audience, uh, the inevitable upside of this development. And to summarize the entire thing, she literally raised her hands in a kind of uh, a victory salute and said, shouted basically, we're going mainstream, she said. And everybody in the place basically rose up as if they were at a Tony Robbins seminar <laughs> and you know, said amen at the top of their lungs and before you know it, the music is rising, you know, ns, 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 and all of that kind of thing. <laughs> and I'm sitting there in the front row thinking, Jesus Christ, you know, this is, this is lunacy. Mm. But anyway, I, I quietly waited my turn. And, and uh, at some point in my, my offering, one of the things I asked is whether or not anyone who was in favor of going mainstream in this regard ever wondered what happened to all the other things that went mainstream before them. Anything that went mainstream before them. What was it before it went mainstream? And the answer is more often than not, it was dangerous. It was deeply alternative. It was troubled and troubling at the same time. And it was willing to take chances. And the nanosecond you go mainstream and get funding and all of that stuff, man, that, all those attributes are gone. Of course they're gone. Anyone with a conscience knows that these things disappear. The nanosecond, the government funds you or private industry or the insurance realm funds you or, or whatever it is, people, enough people say yes to you, it's because you're easy to say yes to. Mm. So what's my point in all this? It's this. 
when a death phobic culture generates solutions to death phobia, you can be absolutely certain that the goal of these measures is not to diminish or dissolve the death phobia. You can be sure that on the other side of the adoption of these measures, the death phobia is in fact intact, fully functioning, and has absorbed this latest, greatest alternative in a way that pretends to be offering alternatives, as any consumer culture will do, and at the same time keeping uh, in, in uh, work, good working order the culture and, or, or the orientation that produced the longing for it in the first place. And interestingly enough, by doing so, they create greater longing for it. Right? So, the, so the longing comes from what's missing in the culture. And psilocybin looks like, quote, something that's missing in the culture. It's not, of course. The, the, having resort to psychedelics, just to take that example, uh, is a consequence of what's missing in the culture. And the, what's missing in the culture is not mysteriously present because you get to get, have a drug at the end of your life. It's still missing. Mm -hmm. And this is what makes that stuff so compelling. And, uh, you know, an alternative to, I, I don't mean to take over the discussion here, I'll stop in a second, but, but the, the, a good parallel to that is the advent of the notion that suicide is a personal right, much in the same way that, you know, quote unquote, identity or gender politics is a personal right to declare and to self-identify and nobody has anything to say about it. It's all yours to dial it in and to hold it up and to champion it. And no one has the right to wonder about it or question you or, 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 or question your insistence of uh, disfiguring the language fundamentally to come up with bizarre pronouns that everybody's supposed to pretend are meaningful. I could go on. The point of the ma that I'm making here is Suicide, when it is elevated and enthroned as a personal right, as an expression of personal freedom, is another juvenile gesture. Because what it does is it guarantees that you will not be there to taste the consequences of the exercise of your right. Everyone else will be there everyone who didn't exercise their right to self-annihilate, they'll be there. They'll be living the consequence of what you put into motion. They'll be living the indictment that you left behind, whether you left behind a suicide note or not. Everyone else will be on the receiving end of the consequences of what you've done, but not you. Does that st still sound like a right? Or does it sound something perilously close to self-indulgence, mm. instead masquerading as something that God wants you to have for yourself. Mm. Um, jump, jumping back a little bit, um, I really appreciate your comments there on suicide. As I said, being in the midst of, uh, of the consequences of somebody taking that right uh, to themselves, I mean, it was a complicated situation because they were in the midst of a psychotic episode. Mm -hmm. um, but going back to your discussions about psychedelics there, and especially the idea that, you know, going mainstream is some sort of positive step for an alternative mm -hmm. culture. And of course, when it comes to the research and the actions of the people around the psilocybin um, assisted psychotherapy research, especially in the dying field from the people who I've spoken to, their main concern is in many ways, um, the reduction of suffering and to offer people a greater spaciousness um, in their dying time and that space um, giving them opportunities for more grace. As, as you said, there, there is something missing in the culture and, you know, by virtue of psilocybin arriving, you know, that thing that is missing does not mysteriously appear. Um, and at the same time, it seems like for many people that psilocybin helps to maybe unravel a little bit of the consequences of that not being there for them enough so that they can die something closer to a a a, a, mm -hmm. uh, a well a, a well died death i don't know if 
that's great that's great info uh or or, or grammar there um so i see i i really i do uh, i do invite you to look look at the research and the intentions behind the researchers as the ones that i've met don't seem to be about um, they seem to be very clear on what death phobia is doing in in palliative care and, and are hoping to to shift that in some way. And actually your comment about mainstream, especially with psychedelics, um, this is one of the reasons why I have yet to, despite everybody recommending me to, reading Michael Pollan's new book on psychedelics because he created a mainstream narrative for it and I'm not interested in being a part of the Michael Pollan mainstream psychedelic narrative. I'm interested in staying deep in the alternative and pushing the edges, not rounding my edges out so that I can fit into the mainstream parade. Um, and I'm going to give you just an opportunity to respond to that if you like, and then I'd like to move on to another question. I'm not talking about, uh, in, in my comment about this, you know, I prefaced it by saying, I haven't read the stuff. Mm -hmm. uh, I'm not going to read the stuff. It's not something that compels or interests me in any way. I don't take any pride in that. I'm just acknowledging that mm -hmm. there's only so many hours in the day, so many, only so many days in a lifetime. And it's proper to decide what you're going to do with them. Agreed. So there's that. I don't, I don't say that with any arrogance. I, I simply am not compelled by the stuff. But, but with that in mind, <coughs> I simply say this. Um, whatever the motivations are of the people who are doing the research and doing the practice, I, I come back to the lamentable observation that... Taking, if taking a drug is the difference between depth and glibness, if that's what it's come down to, I'm happily on the outside of that whole thing. That's what I'm saying. I'm, it's, this is not an anti-drug thing per se that I'm saying. What I'm saying is when it's that easy and that available, I'm wondering why there's, the measures are not being taken to address the circumstance that eventually appears to make the availability of the drug necessary as a comfort-giving, suffering-reducing proposition. Mm. Mm. The problem is, on the other side of that solution, baby, all the suffering is still there. Everything that made it suffering is still there. And, and the kind of culture level labor that should be devoted to wondering from whence comes the suffering remains undone unimagined and and there seems to be no sense of of kind of responsibility to what to the generations to come to take this work on simply to make another drug available and imagine that that's the least you can do for the people who are coming after you sound like more of the same to me and 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 there's the suffering washing up on shore with all that plastic for another generation. Hmm. Hmm. Um, yeah, I, I, I'm I'm on board with you on on some on definitely on some things there, especially you know that it's like it's not it's not changing the way things are that's causing these issues. Although um, from personal experience, I, I uh, from personal experience, I can I can assure you that a psilocybin an encounter with psilocybin is by no means um, an easy one, or one that brings the alleviation of suffering through the through the drug action. So much as it is a uh, possibly some relief at the end of it for the hours and hours you spent encountering all the suffering you've been hiding from your whole life. Um, so le leaving leaving that there, not to by any means sort of like make my word the last word, um, but I would like to move on to a different. Uh, a different topic, mm -hmm. sort sort of. Um, one of the other things that was present in our last conversation was a discussion about hope. Um, and I'll do my best to characterize what I interpret of your premise on hope, in particular to dying, which is something along, along the lines of um, hope is when we write off today for the prospect of a better future. And that when it comes to dying, um, hope by no means serves us because like, what is it that we're hoping for? Because dying is still there. Um, 
and I really, really appreciated your connection to with the hope thing insofar as as matrimony as well, like hoping for a beautiful relationship instead of being in the one that could be beautiful right now lying next to that person. Um, and I want to bring this to what we've, you know, what you've skirted around, which is the environmental crisis uh, that we as a human species and as a planet and all the species upon it are facing right now. And given or that- Or not facing. What, what do you- uh, or not facing right now. Or not facing, yes. Okay, sorry, yes. I said we're not facing. I was like, oh. Um, but uh, yes, I want to bring it there. And I, I, I feel like I grasp um, a sense of understanding around where hope fails us um, insofar as dying, insofar as taking us away from the present moment, and where hopelessness stands in when we realize hope won't work, and then that just you know, exacerbates the same cycle and that mm -hmm. you say we should give ourselves the something like the the, the right or the gift of, of living a life hope free. But when it comes to what we're facing right now as a as a planet, um, and with the environmental crisis, is and I, I've debated about this with with several of my friends, because I'm very curious about it. Does hope not serve a purpose in 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 the sense of the the sense in us that something better can come of this, even though it all looks terrible now, if we are inspired by that sense, like and letting that sense of something possible be there, um, as we effort towards making that possibility, and the possibility being like saving the earth from our the destruction at our own hands, um, and so I I think that was kind of a convoluted a uh, convoluted question, and I'm sorry about that. But I, I trust your ability to, to parse out what I mean um, insofar as hope and its role right now in what we're facing as a planet with this mass extinction and environmental crisis. Okay. Uh, let me see what I can do with this. First of all, uh, and to me, my mind, most importantly, that the focus of your question was not, quote, the environmental crisis. The focus of your question Although you didn't say it exactly in the way that I'm going to say it now, I, I hope you'll find it to be a fair representation of it. Went something like this. I need to engage these dilemmas in a certain kind of feeling state, a certain kind of orientation that allows me to proceed and to take action. And that's the focus of the observation that you made. It's not what's going on in the world, and it's certainly not how we got here. It has everything to do with, now, I need something else. And here's what it is. I need to be properly oriented to the possibilities that could ensue from the work that I ought to take on. And that's a prerequisite. And without it, you can't reasonably expect me to sign up for active duty in a time of trouble. You didn't say all those things, but you know they were in what you said. Okay, so my point in responding to it is to articulate it as follows. When do you suppose the generations of Western people who presented us the dilemma we now find ourselves in are going to be willing to set aside their personal requirement for a personal sense of well-being? And the promise that that will continue and that they shall be rewarded for the work they propose to undertake. When are Western people going to be willing to forego the payday before they do the work? Because my, my point is simply this. If that's what you require, it's more of the same for you. Hope in and of itself is engaged in the mo I'm not saying I don't understand the draw of the thing. I believe I do. And I'm not dismissing the draw. What I'm trying to do in response to your question is elaborate the consequences of remaining addicted to the, to the kind of methadone drip called it could still work out. I mean, make a simple observation. Do you really believe that we need to know ahead of time that it could all still work out as a precondition 
for working on it working out. My, my own encounters with these matters are basically the answer is yes. The Western world seems absolutely addicted to the reassurance that their labors will not be in vain as a prerequisite for laboring. And I just find this so in, a, in almost a ghosted way, a, a kind of juvenile unwillingness to show up for active adult duty. And it, it really, it, it really uh, sets me to lament over this matter that it's another out clause. The, the requiring of being hopeful is another way to make sure that nobody hits us up for too much work. You know, uh, I've had many a person ask me some version of what you've said, other things besides, and the case that's generally made over and over again is, don't you understand, this is to me now, don't you understand that you have to work out your personal sense of gross misfortune before you can be relied upon in, you know, in the great, to join the greater fray. And, and it falls to me to say, so let me get this right. What do we do in the meantime, waiting for you to get your shit together? waiting for you to feel better about it all, waiting for you to be reassured that if we just find the right fill in the blank, that we're going to pull it off at the 11th hour and 59th minute. What are the rest of us supposed to do while you're trying to get it all together? <laughs> you know what the answer is. We, we got to fill in for you. And my, my simple case to be made is something like this. If I, you know, if I'm lucky enough to be with a dozen people who are hope free on this matter, the chances of us engaging these things without the pre without the, the qualification of being reassured first raises in me a sense of a, a trustworthiness in them and a recognizable adulthood in them and some kind of incipient elderhood in them. And I could point in the other direction and say the increasing reliance upon, you know, feeling hopeful and having some faith that, um, you know, the right technology will finally eclipse the bad technology, all that kind of thing is virtually the same kind of dilemma as I was articulating for you about, from my point of view, the psilocybin thing, the euthanasia thing, the suicide thing. These are remarkably consistent approaches, even though they seem wildly different areas of endeavor. But if you, if you investigate the kind of mobilizing misery that underwrites all of them, at least to my eye, they're, they're almost garishly similar from one to the next to the next. Uh, to for clarification um just so that you or the listeners don't uh, get a mischaracterization of mischaracterization of where i'm coming from um i'm very much in the camp of not believing hope will is a prerequisite or even being ready <laughs> being a prerequisite to starting and um as far as i'm concerned it seems more likely that we're all going to die off and the uh then Otherwise, but that I continue to proceed efforting towards something positive in the sense of like doing the work that's required in order to, you know, push towards what I would prefer by far, which is us mm -hmm. to sort this giant issue out in a way that supports and enables humanity to continue on in a way that might over time regenerate the damage that we've done. Um, and also as an uncle, considering the, you know, the consequences on, on the, on the little humans in my life who I believe in, but that hope isn't required. I'm not doing it because it, it, it might still get better. I'm doing it because it feels somewhere deep in me that it's the right thing to do, even mm -hmm. if the world is ending, you know, that it makes as sense. It's yes. As it's ending. Not, to, not even if, right? as it's ending. Thank you. Yeah. yeah. To, per, to proceed as though my actions still matter. Well, how about this? Rather than proceed as if my actions still matter, how about proceed as if my actions have consequence? Yes, thank you. Yeah. Mm. This is a little more neutral way of acknowledging 
things, isn't it? You know, that's why I make that suggestion. I've asked people in my school constantly. I've implored them and I've insisted that they proceed as if they're agents of consequence. That's the language that, that we crafted early on as, an, as a kind of bracing antidote to the notion that no matter what I do, uh, everything turns to shit or, or will continue as it is or, or that I'm, I'm basically consequence free because I can't trace the consequence of my action uh, to anything that I believe in or don't believe in. These, these are all escape clauses, of course. And I, I think you're still halfway through what you wanted to say. I'm sorry to interrupt. No, I think I, I think that you, I, I believe I got out what, what I was intending and, and you responded to it appropriately. Yeah. So I appreciate that. So, you know, if you, the fact that you don't require hope is uh, laudable from my point of view. Uh, that's great. But I think both of us could acknowledge that the lion's share of the people who are listening in, the chances are very good that the centrality of hope uh, makes what I said so unpalatable uh, as to you know become uh, tyrannous, mm. and, and and so I, I think the the dilemma that I articulated and that you distance yourself from is very much out there, mm-hmm. not in just quote the debate, you know, not there. It's there in what doesn't happen. It's there in the the failure of voluntary restraint, of voluntary withdrawal before you're left with no choice kind of thing. Mm-hmm. That, that's the great lament to me is the, is the utter unwillingness to stop instead of waiting to be stopped. Yeah, I, I, I agree. I agree with, your, with you there, Stephen, which is why I characterized the question the way that I did initially, um, because it, I do feel like there's a lot of listeners that are coming from that, from that perspective. And, and, um, and I was hoping to hear your thoughts on it the exact way that you presented it or something akin to what you offered. Um, Now we, I'm just going to do a little check in here. We had planned for an hour. Um, We're at, I think about 47 minutes since you and I started talking. Um, And I'm going to go into another phase of, of, of questions and try to round it out around the hour. But if at that point you're still feeling raring to go, uh, let me know. Um, and I'll, I'll have a few more, um, this, so looking at hope as this sort of like central motivator, uh, to maybe given a shit that there's the other side of that, which is the hopelessness. And I had this experience recently at the grocery store where an actual conversation almost arose um, where I made the joke around the, uh, around like, oh, you know, at what point is uh, our past plastic bags going to be phased out? Now, this was a major grocery store chain, you know, law mm-hmm. laws, you know, mm-hmm. so it's an obvious like tongue in cheek joke. They're never going to phase out plastic bags unless they're forced by some sort of like legislation. Sure. Um, I'm like, when are they going to phase it out? Ha ha ha. And then what could have been a conversation, although I suspect afterwards it was just an opportunity for the cashier to have her opinions heard by another person, um, seem to, you've heard this before, I, I, I feel very confident, which is something along the lines of, yes, it's all very terrible. I'm just waiting for that comment to come. Comment. Comment, you know, something, you know, like basically Mm -hmm. we'll all be better off once humans are wiped from this earth. Right. And of course this, this characterizes methanthropy, misanthropy excuse me mm-hmm. um and i mean i again it wasn't a conversation uh, as i described so my gentle suggestions around there being maybe some value to human life on this planet um were not really well received or even heard and i'm just curious what your thoughts are um with misanthropy as the growing response to the trouble that we're in right now sorry What's your question about the misanthropy? Basically, like, what are your thoughts on that response to our, to, to us, uh, to our situation? Like, and, and in that, I guess I'm, I'm kind of asking, like, is there a value to human life? Would we be better off if we were, I mean, we, the planet be better off if we were all just killed? <laughs> Excuse me. Um, well, first of all, I don't think that misanthropy is a response. It's, it's the collapse of response. 
You know, it's the easiest non-response to have. It sure sounds like a response. But uh, in the willful self-annihilation is the absence of the capacity to respond. Right? You think about our verb, the verb to understand. Today, we mean it in a sort of comprehensive way. Uh, it's, a, it's an allegation of comprehension. But, of course, it's a spatial uh, word, and, it's, and if it's engaged at the level of its uh, ordinariness, it has a lot to say to us. The capacity to understand is predica predicated on the willingness to stand under what you propose to draw some bead on. That's why it's called understanding. You see, it locates you and then gives you a function. Locates you underneath what you propose to try to, to have some, 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 some clarity about, uh, instead of uh, over and above it, instead of speculating at a great distance, it locates you underneath the place that would seem the least uh, enabling of a comprehensive take on things. And then it obliges you to stand there. That's what the function of understanding um, pleads for, the willingness to stand under. And that's the reason we have that word is because of the etymology of our word A-R-C-H, which is the root word for archetype and, and architecture and arcane and many, many words as it happens. And all of these point to the fact that the real, the nature of the, the, the arch, the architectural feature called the arch, uh, you can't locate the arch up in the air, you see, because if it wasn't engaged on the ground and in the ground, it would not have the capacity to arc as it does and to sustain the weight that is above it. So the reason we have the word archetype is it's whispering to us quietly that the real arche is to be found in the foundation, beneath the foundation, if you will. So this is my way of saying then that I think, you know, our principal obligation in a time of, uh, of extraordinary uh, belittling of, of individual opinion and stance and things of this kind is to be willing to not be so sure of ourselves, nor to generate, quote, solutions and stand by them no matter what, or trade them in for the latest, greatest, newest uh, uh, solution. And, and to, to do something that requires more discipline than it requires a uh, sense of uh, good outcome for tomorrow. The word discipline means the, the kind of rigor of, of uh, approach that you're willing to take upon yourself for the sake of the learning you propose to have or to obtain uh, from the one in, uh, that you hold in high esteem. And that's the root word for d disciple as well. And we might be disciples of trouble. This would not be a bad outcome in the, in the short term. If, if, if we were really willing for our heartache on these matters to be the master of the proceedings. And in that sense, it wouldn't be our heartache at all, really. What it would be, our heartbrokenness is not something that we are masters of, but we could be in, in a real way tutored by it. And that would be, you know, heartbreak is a genuine, authentic response to implacable troubles, either romantically, existentially, you know, ecologically, uh, the observation I think holds. And the, the, to, to, to genuflect in the direction of self-hatred, either as a species or as an individual or as a race or as a particular culture. I mean, all of these things show a palpable unwillingness to take upon oneself the discipline of learning. Because that's what mis misanthropy does. It absolves you of the obligation to learn because you're just shit and nothing good can come from you. It's, in other words, 
excuse me, my own frailty is showing in my voice, as you can hear. Mm. Um, in other, sorry, I'm going to have to do that one more time. <coughs> this is why I only had an hour in me. I've just come back from a long uh, tour of Iceland and so forth. So um, anyway, the whole thing, for me, the, the point I was making comes down to this. I leave people to their misanthropy if they insist. That's like feeding your children the kids' menu at any restaurant of your choice. You might imagine that because, of, because it's called a kids' menu, it's good for your kids. But if you investigate it for five seconds, it's an abomination masquerading as a menu. Mm -hmm. And misanthropy is something similar. It's a meager and miserly diet pretending to be a feast of conscience. But it's not a feast of conscience. It's the annihilation of conscience and the unwillingness to, to be visited in an in a ongoing way by the consequences that were put into motion by the people who acted on our behalf until it was our turn. And then a, <coughs> a sorrowful unwillingness to really change course when it was our turn. I'm not saying misanthropy is not understandable. I'm just saying it's a mixture of cowardice and an unwillingness to show up. Mm. I'm sorry that's miserable to listen to somebody coughing, but it's not going to go away. And I think it's better if I uh, don't subject you or anybody's listening to uh, to the fact that I can't seem to get on the other side of this this coughing thing. And yeah, I completely understand, Stephen. I'll, I'll do my best to cut out uh, some of the more disruptive, high-level cough sounds uh, when I okay. do the post-production. Um, right. I look, f I have a longing for conversation with you at some point again in the future. So there was a couple key questions that I don't feel are, are appropriate to ask of you, given uh, given the challenge of a variety of things you're coughing, as well as I only can imagine how much jet lag you have coming back from Iceland yesterday. Yeah, yeah. Um, but uh, I will express a, a deep gratitude for the opportunity to uh, to speak with you uh, today, and um, and for your willingness to continue to share um, to continue to share uh, with the Adventures of the Mind audience as well as in general in in the in the larger culture. So thank you, Stephen. Thank you. You're very kind. We'll uh, we'll see you. I believe we're coming to a town near you pretty soon. <laughs> Yes, very soon. I look forward to seeing you in person. Very good. Thanks a lot, man. Bye, Stephen. Bye-bye now. Okay, that's it for this episode of Adventures Through the Mind. Thank you very much for tuning in. Thank you very much for following up with Stephen's work uh, and checking him out. Um, the links to find more of his stuff will be in the show notes to this episode at jameswgesso.com. And uh, maybe I will see you at one of his events. Well, I'll see you possibly at his event in Kitchener on September 12th. Or uh, maybe you'll you'll feel me in the Ontario spirit when you're there to see him in London on the 28th. Um, definitely check out Nights of Grief, Grief and Mystery if it ever comes to your town. It's a really, really cool event. Furthermore, big thanks for following up from this podcast by going to jamesdbjesso.com forward slash support and supporting the podcast in some way. Patreon is an amazing way to do so because you could throw me the equivalent of a cup of coffee once a month, and that adds into a cumulative reservoir of uh, what has become my financial, my income, essentially. So, and it is what powers the show and powers my continued work upon it and the larger body of work that I produce. So Patreon's great, and I'd love for you to become my patron. Additionally, you can leave me a PayPal uh, donation or uh, buy something on jameswjessa.com forward slash shop. Links to everything are contained in the show notes. Big thank you, big thank you for tuning in, and uh, I will see you on the next episode of Adventures Through the Mind. Take care.